Good morning, Lompoc. Good morning, Lompoc. Happy Friday. <laughs> happy Friday and happy Juneteenth. Yes. Uh, it's new on our radar for um, us not having paid attention for a long time, but yeah. this is what we're going to be talking about today. Yep. So it should be a exciting show with lots of history yep. and lots of education, hopefully. So thank you all for tuning in. Uh, make sure you invite your friends and um, share if you don't mind. That'd be yeah. very helpful. And I know we'll have some new people joining us today. And mm -hmm. if this is your first time watching, yes. um, I'm Michelle and Jeremy Ball. And we just started this uh, show from our shed in our backyard in Lompoc. And we wanted to share good news and also stories from people here in Lompoc mm -hmm. who are doing awesome things. So that was the, the whole point of this show. And then obviously a few weeks ago, um, the world kind of changed. In addition to COVID, uh, we had a horrible killing of um, George Floyd and um, mm -hmm. protests and more attention on Black Lives Matter have, have been um, coming out. So we want to take some time to, to talk about these things mm -hmm. that we didn't really learn in school, unfortunately. Yeah. So, And again, this is uh, we're not uh, angling at a certain position or trying to be political here. This yeah. is history. And I think knowledge is power. So yeah. we're just trying to sift through this and learn as much as we can, too. And Thank you guys for joining us on yep. our journey. And today's show, we we spoke with a few people from the mm -hmm. community. So we chatted with Navy Blue and mm -hmm. Angie. Um, they they live in Santa Maria. I believe. They're in Santa Maria, yep. but they, there's a reason why we talked to them. Yep. And I, once we they'll be sharing them. a little mm -hmm. bit more about Juneteenth and their involvement. Um, we also got a chance to talk to Daryl Tullis, who's a mm -hmm. longtime Lompoc local, um, former Air Force, came out to Lompoc in 2001. Mm -hmm. So chatted with him a little bit about um, what he's been doing and what he thinks are important for the next steps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also had a chance to talk to Vic and Bill Thompson. So um, kind of in light of Father's Day, uh, a father-son yeah. honest conversation here about yeah. what's going on and race relations here. And um, Yes. Yeah, so today um, we're talking, w the idea here is we're going to give you as just a little tidbit of the history of Juneteenth. We're not trying to be your last resource yes. for learning everything about Juneteenth, but just some tidbits. And we're hopeful that you'll take some time and do your own research and dig into some of these things. There's way too much to fit in one show to, to talk is. about all there this is. stuff. And, we're, and when we're talking to um, different folks, we're not necessarily just talking about Juneteenth. We're just trying to listen and try to bring some perspectives to our audience. So yep. I think it should be fascinating today. Yeah. yeah. So I, I know personally, the first time I heard about Juneteenth was two weeks ago. Yeah. That's really sad. Sadly. Um, yeah. But Juneteenth is really like Independence Day for mm -hmm. uh, for black people. It's when um, the slaves who had been here <laughs> in the U.S. for a lot longer than many of us um, finally got their day of freedom. So mm -hmm. the uh, well, let's go through some of these uh, images that we have here. Yeah. So. So this is just hearkening back to before you change it. So yep. this is hearkening back to just some of the uh, the rhetoric or the uh, things that were being printed back in that day. And this is a um, a slide of uh, Lincoln versus his competition. And you'll notice on the left hand side you see both black and white kids coming out of a school. Huh crazy. Yeah. This was in the 1860s. And on the right side, the alternative or his opponent, you see that slavery is still pushed. And that was the, the defense of slavery was the opposition. So anyway, yeah. just fascinating to me, just seeing uh, both black and white kids coming out of school in the 1860s was, it took another, what, at least 100 years for um, integration to happen? Yeah, kind that's crazy. crazy to think about. Yeah. Oh my anyway, gosh, yeah. And a lot of this I found on the Library of Congress, which is just go there and type in Juneteenth or slavery, and there's just so many resources. Um, I, this is just an amazing lithograph that I, you know, that was of Lincoln during that time. I found that really to be fascinating. Yeah, but it really, that that's all we get from from history mm -hmm. is that, um, you know. Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, and that was it. And that's the end of racism, good. right? Yep. I mean, and then we heard about the civil rights mov movement because be things were still weren't good, yep. and and that was it. And that's when you know when I graduated high school in two thousand two, I thought racism was over. So <laughs> it just goes to show what we what we were teaching and kind of um, the awareness because it's not like things, it's not like things weren't happening to black people at that time. It's mm -hmm. so it's pretty pretty mind boggling. And the, the thing for me for Juneteenth is just the you know. When you're a young kid, you just assume when slavery was over, it probably took a couple weeks and everyone just kind of um, adjusted and yeah. adapted and everyone's free and we move about our day. And it yeah. took yeah, it took a long time to get a, a few of these things worked out. Um, yeah. So do you want to talk about this a little bit? Sure. I, 
I don't know how much to read into some of this, but um, you'll notice, I don't know if you can see it up at the top, it says slavery is dead and there's question marks. Um, so I think this was during the transition time when a lot of the states in the South were still not okay with what was happening. So um, it's just fascinating to me to go back and see artwork that was put together um, that was trying to see both sides of what was happening. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, this is another uh, little artwork of Robert E. Lee surrendering to the Union. So it was in April, mm -hmm. April of 1865. And then it wasn't until um, it wasn't until June 19th of 1865, mm -hmm. so two months after the Civil War ended, mm -hmm. two and a half years since the Emancipation, Pro Emancipation Proclamation that General Gordon Granger mm -hmm. went to Texas, it was the last remaining Confederate state, and told roughly 250,000 slaves there that were just waking up in the morning, doing their work, um, <laughs> unpaid work. Hey, you guys, you're yeah, free. You're free. So um, Sorry it took so long. Yep. That so that was it, and there's still some controversy behind that. They say like he waited until the end of cotton season to let them know, but uh, you well, know, that's you want to make sure you folklore hey, there. When you have free labor, you know that that's that's affects right. your profit. So you want to hang on to that. Um, yeah. And then this is one of the celebrations of Juneteenth. So it's mm -hmm. not like. It's not like we just started Juneteenth or celebrating it, you know, this year. Um, it's been celebrated for a long time. This was from 1900 in Austin. Mm -hmm. And um, really, I guess, after after Juneteenth in, 19, in 1865, it, it, was a, it was a big celebration mm -hmm. day for blacks, um, for black people in America. And then... They after the Jim Crow laws, I heard is when um, it kind of became a little bit more private, and they started celebrating in their churches because it it was dangerous to celebrate. Mm -hmm. um, and then it kind of became revived again in the in the 19, 1960s after the Civil Rights Movement, um, and then again after the Rodney King beating and the riots. Um, so mm -hmm. that's when it, it seems like every time something bad happens, that's when it gets attention from from white people basically yeah. so that's pretty sad and but maybe this was, um, you know maybe this time it's a little different in yeah. that um it, there's a lot of us that aren't black and there's mexican people and people of all races that are that are dialing in on this yeah. issue and showing their support and so, that's one yeah. of the things that we heard echoed from pretty much everybody mm -hmm. we talked to is that maybe this time could be different maybe um maybe because so many of people who who aren't black who don't necessarily think that they have an interest in this are mm -hmm. joining in and um and there's some interesting perspectives mm -hmm. there and I, I really hope that this means that there will be some type of permanent change this was one other slide from um this was so you said around yeah. 1920. I think around 1920. This in was Richmond. the celebration for Juneteenth in Richmond, Virginia. Yeah, yeah. So we have a couple more stories um, to share, but first I think we should go to Navy Blue and Angie. So I have to set them yep, up. Yep, so, please do. And uh, these two fine ladies live in Santa Maria, and the reason we're talking to them, and it's okay because it's Santa Barbara County, <laughs> is um, our good friend Yasmin Dawson turned us on to uh, both of them, and Angie helped set up the first Juneteenth. Uh, celebration in Santa Maria, I think in maybe 1992. Wow. Um, so she helped right after the riots. Then, yeah, and she LA. helped. Okay. She helped really develop the Black Student Union, which yeah. I'd never heard of until I had talked to them um, there locally. And then Navy Blue. Yeah. Amazing name, by the way. <laughs> um, she is 16 years old, and she's both the president of her. Uh, three things. She's the president of her high school. Yeah. She's the president of the regional black student union. And for the youth side of the black student union at the state level, she's the president of that as that's well. Amazing. 16 so years old. I, what was we I are, doing? When we I was are 16? underachievers. That's for sure. So. But anyway, uh, they both, um, and I want to thank them both specifically for um, helping us understand a little bit more about Juneteenth. And then we just wanted to kind of showcase that collaborative stuff that can happen throughout the central coast yes. too because uh these are issues this is uh, black people both in lompoc and santa maria are definitely the minority so um connecting the dots and working together yeah um, she's a um, navy blue is a shiny example yes. of that so, so here enjoy. we go thank you so much well my name is navy blue sims i'm 16. i'm going to be a senior at pioneer valley high school i'm president of our black student union and president of the united black student unions of california state board um, and the southern regional board uh, my name is angie eugene bolden born and raised in new orleans Louisiana. uh i've been in santa maria california for 30 years but i've been in california for over 57 years Mother of two, grandmother. I'm involved with the Black Student Union, 
local and statewide with the United Black Student of California. Being involved with the BSU has been a blessing because our kids get a chance to experience not only what they have in the community, but get a chance to experience other kids and see there's better things out there for them. Um, it's been my passion since I started high school and joined Black Student Union to really um, just uplift other Black students. We helped get a Black Student Union going at Lompoc High School. And they are an amazing Black Student Union. They came to our regional conference. We all ride the bus together, the Santa Maria High School kids, Pioneer Valley High School, Rigetti, and Lompoc. We all went down there together. Um, and it's amazing that we're starting to strengthen the Central Coast um, Black Student Unions. Yeah. Um, how has the last month or so influenced or changed you, or how has that affected you? If you recall around 2014, 2015, there were the Ferguson protests and Michael Brown, um, Tamir Rice, all of that. Um, I was like 11-ish. And so that was basically like an eye-opening moment for me. And that's when I started to realize um, the weight of being Black in America and being um, a Black child just trying to grow up. So um, I saw that come and go. And that's what also encouraged me to become a part of Black Student Union. Um, but then to see this reemerge, it seems like tenfold of what 2014 had and the real power of it is now it's not only black people fighting for ourselves there's other people fighting alongside us one of the greatest um changes for me is seeing uh friends and people that i usually wouldn't speak on about these issues suddenly become very vocal um and it's a good opportunity for education for a lot of people and i know that it's um uncomfortable for a lot of people as well but this is really something that black people have had to deal with um, to the end of time so you just got to get used to it you know and i don't see this going away until there's a real change being as young as you are and as so much time has passed i'd love for you to tell us how to you know not just understanding the history but what does this mean to you the idea or the commemoration of juneteenth so the best analogy i can give is juneteenth is basically the black independence day it's our equivalent of fourth of july and it is a shame that not many people know about it. Um, I say that that stems from the education system because I know as a kid going to school in California and everything, we got Martin Luther King Jr. for like a week and then maybe Rosa Parks, the Abraham Lincoln came and he freed the slaves and everything was cool. And that's not really how it works. So Juneteenth was June 19th, 1865, um, a whole two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation, which only worked for like, the closest um, enslaved people to the union lines and the rest were ignored. It is a day for education and learning and paying homage to those who came before us because without their preservation and their, um, their courage, then we wouldn't even be here today. So um, it's a very important holiday for everyone to acknowledge. It does suck a little bit that uh, it's only coming to light in this kind of rocky situation, but there's good that comes out of it because new people will be educated um, and then teach their children, hopefully. It's something that we need to celebrate. And the more I learn about Juneteenth, about the Emancipation Proclamation being signed, and it took them two years to find out that they was free. And my great grandmother, she's my mom's grandmother, so she's my great grandmother, and she's a first freeborn slave. And this is the first thing I ever got emotional. I think about it, the more I think about it, it really touched me to know that they kept this from them for two years without telling them, telling our family that you guys are free. It's crazy. It's crazy. And, and, and now the more I think, well, I see this is time, you know, and the kids, I feel our generation coming up now, even now, they need to know more about Juneteenth. And I think it's very important that we, as African Americans, we as Black people, celebrate our culture with joy because we could still be in slavery, just like our ancestors are. Basically, the one thing that I want people to take from this is that Black American history is American history, and that all of our walks of life are interwoven with each other's. And if this significant holiday has been glossed over by the majority of people, can you imagine how much else has been ignored? So. If you're wondering what you can do to support Black people during our time of need this Juneteenth, I would say to take the time to educate yourself, um, check the things you've missed um, because our history classes obviously haven't been doing that and you have to take the initiative to learn yourself. 
Um, there's been attempts like this in the past, but it can't just be black people fighting on their own. We do need support. Um, and I think that'll do um, the most good you can. They're awesome. Ah, that was, I that, was so impressed. Yeah. I can't <laughs> wait. I can't wait to meet them both. Um, yeah. But I'd love to just uh, interview Navy. She just I love the way her mind thinks. Oh so, my yeah. gosh. I can't ima I can't yeah. wait to see what you do Navy in like 10 years, even 5. Yeah, well, I mean. Anyway, so yeah. uh, again, thank you I everyone in Lompoc, don't be yelling at us for talking to somebody in Santa Maria. It's okay. <laughs> um, but I do want to give a shout out to the and I forgot to grab a screen capture of it, yeah. but the the group here I believe they call themselves Block, which is a yeah. new group, collaborative group that's you put themselves it. together here in Lompoc. Um, they're hosting uh, their first Juneteenth celebration this evening, tonight, uh, from 5.30 to 7, over close to Sassafras. And if you don't know where that's at, a lot of the food trucks on Friday nights will park. And this is on Ocean and close to V Street. V Street. Yep very close to ocean. Um, but anyway, 5.30 to 7, uh, there's going to be some entertainment, there's going to be some speeches, um, an opportunity to celebrate Juneteenth. So yeah. if you're curious, doesn't matter what color you are, um, if you're curious and you want to celebrate something that's very special, then maybe consider that yep. tonight. Yep. Celebrate Juneteenth. So. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much. Um, and then we will also had some, there's, there's so many in amazing photos and recordings from former slaves that they did in the early 1920s and 30s. So if you mm -hmm. go online, you can find a few of those and Library read little Congress, ex yeah. excerpts. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm so glad they were able to get those before, you know, these historical mm -hmm. treasures, you know, passed away and all the, that information was lost. Yeah. Um, but you found one on Fountain Hughes. Yeah. So um, Fountain Hughes, uh, I believe they interviewed him in uh, uh, 1949, um, and his he just has an amazing story. And if you go to the Library of Congress and you type in Fountain Hughes, you can find a half an hour interview with him. Um, we've got a couple slides here. I just grabbed maybe a minute, minute and a half of the audio. Again, there's no video here, but I'd love for you to listen um, to a former slave just, just chatting about life. Um, who did you work for, Uncle Fountain? When who did I work for? Yeah. When I, you mean when I was a slave? Yeah, when you were a slave, who did you work for? Well, I belonged to um, uh, Burnish when I was a slave. My mother belonged to Burnish, but, uh, but uh, we uh, was all slave children, and soon after, when we found out that we were free, well, then we were uh, bound out to different people, Ficklin, and and Andrews, and all such people that, and we would run away and wouldn't stay with them, well, then we'd just go and stay anywhere we could, and lay over at night and anywhere. We had no home, you know. We just turned out like a lot of cattle, you know how to turn the cattle out in the pasture? Well, after freedom, you know, colored people didn't have nothing. Colored people didn't have no beds when they were slaves. They all slept on the floor. Had it here, had it there. Just like a, a lot of uh, wild people. We didn't, we didn't know nothing. We didn't like to look at no book. And there were some freeborn colored people where they had little education, but there were very few of them where we was. And we all had a, what you call, I might call it now a uh, jail sentence. It just seems we were in jail. Anyway, that's just a piece of that interview. Yeah. If you're if you want to go hear several um, audio interviews with former slaves, uh, Library of Congress is where that's at. So yeah. definitely go and check that out. Pretty amazing. Uh, the thing that uh, you know, it's like we don't you don't know, learn this in school. You don't get into the nuance of things. But you know, uh, in today's society, we sort of have safety nets for things. You know, if yeah. if something's going to happen, we try to try to help folks a little bit. Yeah. But back then, it, it, you just never thought. You know, as okay, you're free. Good luck. Well, they, they, every, they, they got they were given they were given land at first, but sure. then then um, there was the black code that started, I believe, in 1866, yeah. and those were basically trying to put more and more laws 
on blacks mm-hmm. who are now free to basically imprison them again. Yeah. So if you if you, basically they made a lot of different things a crime. Um, so you couldn't go to a certain area or or that would be a crime mm-hmm. and then you get put back in prison. So But and they then, didn't just give land to everybody. My yeah, point my point yeah, is is that there was did. not a quick transition right. into freedom right. and ownership. There was uh, as he mentions, and you have to go look at that or listen to that interview, uh, it just made me stop and think about the, these folks had no idea how to even uh, exercise their freedoms. Yeah. So just that, that time of learning what to do, where to sleep, who to talk to, uh, it, it's just yeah. an overwhelming uh, complication that I hadn't really considered. Right. So, and one yeah. other thing I did learn that was pretty interesting was the KKK was formed, I believe, the year after the first Juneteenth celebration happened. Huh. So as soon as um, slaves, black people were now free to live like everybody else, that was considered to be a, an attack on white people, which I think we, we can honestly say we're all Americans, right? So um, I don't know, something to consider. Yeah. Anyways, we also had a chance to talk to Daryl Tullis. Yes, Daryl Tullis has uh, been a mover and shaker in Lompoc. Um, incredible passion for this community yeah. especially for the young people he moved here in 2001 um, and really wanted to to help the young people um he mm-hmm. got his degree in human services mm-hmm. um and with a minor in psychology from mercer university when he was in the air mm-hmm. force so he served in the air force his father served in the mm-hmm. air force um so he has a really unique perspective too um grew up in oxnard and kind of started with the conversation with him telling us you know he because his family was military they had access to many different things that um, other minorities in Oxnard didn't have access mm-hmm. to. So um, in a way, he kind of felt like, you know, there was yeah. privilege there as well. So you noticed the disparity between, you know, his family's lifestyle in the yeah. military and a lot of the kids that just lived in yeah. Oxnard who didn't have much. So he's been thoughtful for a long time. So um, thank you, Daryl, for joining us and uh, for sharing your time with this special interview. Growing up as a black child uh, with a father in the Air Force, And once he retired, I saw that my counterparts down in Oxnard, a lot of uh, young people who, whose parents weren't in the military, didn't have nearly the opportunities that I had. My 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 oldest brother and I were just talking about this last night. We were talking about the fact that we were kind of shielded from a lot of the things that went on in this country because of the fact that we were military kids. And so on those bases. We, we had a shield, and there's a system on those bases. Your neighbors can't put up that Confederate flag on a, on, a, on a military installation. Your neighbors can't call you certain things. And with the things that are going on in our country right now, for the first time in my life, I feel like a black man when I step out of my house instead of feeling like a spiritual being who happens to be in a black body. I have people who are looking at me either feeling sorry for me or feeling like I got to support you or feeling like that's horrible what they're doing to you and your people. And I'm thinking you should feel like it's horrible what they're doing to our people. We all belong to each other. We're all we're all the same human race and we have no choice about being here. You know, we may have a choice about what town we live in, what state we live in, what country even we live in. But until Elon Musk puts us on Mars, we got nowhere to go. (laughs) It just doesn't make sense, you know, that people don't just stop right where they are and just stop and think, we got to correct this, we got to make this right. You know, we, this country has not dealt with white supremacy. And so, on In every aspect of our lives, there can be someone who is infiltrated from a white supremacist group. We talk about America the beautiful, America the brave, you know, America, greatness in America. And yet we don't want to deal with issues that we know stop us from being great. We cannot be great if we allow white supremacy to stay in this country. If it's, uh, if it's, you know, if you want to call that free speech, and yet you were able to get rid of the Black Panthers. You were able, you know, you want to talk about this new group that comes out, Antifa, and you want to talk about them being domestic terrorists. And they've been around for, I don't know, what, two, three, four years at the most. And yet you don't want to talk about the Klan. You don't want to talk about the neo-Nazis. You don't want to talk about the Aryan, Aryan nation. 
you know, I, I, I met Salud Carbajal, our, our congressman, back when he was running for office. So I said, you know what? Every time I see you, I said, I'm going to remind you that you, uh, if you get elected, you need to put the white supremacists, neo-Nazis, and KKK on the terrorist watch list right along with the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and ISIS. And domestic terrorists is responsible for more death in America than any of those three combined. I said, they need to be in the same place. I said, because my son and my daughter have been over to Iraq, Afghanistan, Jordan, uh, Kuwait, uh, Qatar, uh, several different tours, and yet they come back home and they got to deal with domestic terrorists. That's crazy. And we don't, and America doesn't deal with it. Yeah. So all of this marching in the streets, I'm, I'm glad to see that the, those crowds are mixed crowds. And in fact, in most of them, there are more white people out there because they don't like looking like that. Yeah. But they're, most of them, I would say, are probably 20 to 40 years old at the oldest. You know, they're a younger generation. Mm -hmm. And so they're fed up with it. They don't want that st stigma on them. And he's finally got a bill that has been introduced in Congress. He got over 113 uh, congressmen um, who, who have signed on mm -hmm. to it. And then uh, S for the Senate, it is S3190. Get on your phone, call your congressman, call your senator, and tell them that you want to push that forward. We want domestic terrorism outlawed in America. That's a start. Mm -hmm. Because when you, when you outlaw that, that tells the whole country and the world that America realizes that we have a problem and we're not going to just let it sit and pretend like it doesn't exist. Yeah. And until they do that, America's not serious about equality. Thank you so much, Daryl. <sighs> I think it's great perspective. He, yeah. We had almost an hour long interview with him mm -hmm. and he had so many great things to say. So I apologize that we had to kind of narrow it down to that. But I think mm -hmm. that was a really valuable point. And I didn't even know about those bills that were being introduced. So mm -hmm. it was good for me to go and find out a little bit more about them. Mm -hmm. um, they give you some stats in the bills to as to um, what's going on and the number of deaths um, from domestic terrorism mm -hmm. versus um, Islamic terrorists mm -hmm. uh, or Islamic extremists, I yeah. guess. Um, so that that was eye-opening for me. And look, this is, you know, there's there's arguments and uh, controversies here and there about yeah. this issue, but let's just be honest. If, if you have, if you find in your heart there's room to defend anything about white supremacy, please just find another show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, this, we, uh, if we're, if we're going to be a great country, we have to address this and it's not, it's not easy, but yeah. we got to be real about it. So, Daryl, thank you so much yes. for being honest with us and transparent and talking to us about something that's very important. Yeah. And yeah, if you disagree, that's fine. But we can we can step up I, here. Yeah, yeah, there's there's more than yeah. enough room for everybody. There's still okay. some room to to work on this issue. Yes, there's a long lot way of to room. go. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think that the next person we the last two people we t mm -hmm. spoke with was a father son um bill and vic thompson um vic I, have to, I have to give him background yeah, so please. we've gotten to know vic uh through our good friend darren at crossfit ohana so we've uh, now vic, vic has darren lived in together yes here in here in the lompoc valley mm -hmm. and vic uh, for the f past few years has lived in georgia mm -hmm. in close to atlanta i believe and so he's had an interesting perspective on, uh, you know, a lot of the things and that are Vic happening was there. was former military. Mm -hmm. His dad was military, um, oh. both Air Force. Mm -hmm. um, so they, you know, again, they have an interesting perspective mm -hmm. having lived here and been in the military, but then also being able to see things. Mm -hmm. So um, and then his mom is from the UK. She's British. So we're actually going to meet her this Saturday. Yes. I'm very excited about So we that. had an awesome conversation mm -hmm. with them. It, that also went a little bit long, but we decided to focus just on the two of them mm -hmm. um vic took a moment to interview his dad so yes. and before before you say that uh, or start yeah. that don't forget this sunday is father's day yes so again this interview is vic interviewing his father and we just want to give a happy father's day this weekend to all the amazing dads yes. out there so happy anyway, father's day enjoy this interview so a black dude in ohio is probably not dating outside of the race in your time no but then you go over to italy europe did you feel like when you met, I guess, mom, was that like taboo? Okay. In my 13 years in the military, I always felt more comfortable in England and Italy and other countries than I did here. Mm. 
Why is that? Because of what was going on in America. Okay. <laughs> because I remember, when I, I remember when we got married, I took my wife downtown mm -hmm. in Cleveland. Cleveland was east side black, west side white. Downtown was pretty neutral. Yeah. But when I was down there walking around, I mean, people were just staring at us. Yeah. You know? I mean, I wasn't uncomfortable. And my wife was very naive to the situation. Yeah, yeah. So I had a better outlook on things. Yeah. But we didn't, we didn't have any problems other than people staring at us. Yeah. And one thing about us, after we were married, we always found a church. Okay. And we always found a church, and that was always a safe zone. Because mm -hmm. you meet people in church and everybody's yeah. about Jesus and the Lord and you just get along well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the mil not only the church is a good point, but I think being in the military. Because the military, especially on, well, all military, but even enlisted, it's just a mixed bag. I don't know, when I grew up on um, all the bases that we lived at, there was always kind of white, black, there was a mix, there was a mix of everybody. So I never really right. felt like we were, it wasn't an issue as a young, as a young kid. Right. I think, I, getting older, I think being in the military gave you a, a starting and a jumping off point was different from people that lived in the same place all the time oh, and were sure. never in the military because yeah. you got so many different races and people yeah. and in the military, if I got five stripes and you got four, right. ain't no argument. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, right. There were black officers, there were white officers and everybody yeah. got along. Right what is what jumps out most to you because i well before i asked that my friends kind of came to me and I, the best thing i've seen is do a personal assessment just kind of see don't try to degrade anybody else just see where where you kind of sit at what are your biases what are your privileges but what is the one thing you know being a, a black man um that you're seeing like what's the thing that i guess troubles you the most and maybe excites you the most okay well the thing that excites me the most is the, everybody, all kind of people are in this movement right yeah. now. And before it was only black people. And I was around do this in the 1968 riots when they were putting fire hoses on people, putting dogs and stuff. And it was just crazy. But my main thing now is give me some legislation and do some things that's going to make a positive change because we've been in this place for 400 years. Yeah. Well, let me tell you a story. When I was... 17 years old and I was about to get my driver's license my father sat me down and he gave me the police talk yeah he said if you get stopped by the police keep your hands where they can see them don't do anything fast say yes sir and no sir and you might get home because yeah. back in the day I mean they just mm. they didn't care yeah I'm so glad I didn't have to give you that talk yeah <laughs> I'm pretty sure being mixed, dad black, mom white, I feel like uh, visually I'm not probably a threat where, you know, if I was like 6'8", maybe darker skin, it could be more threatening. But I still, in my head, I'm like, I don't necessarily want to have um, uh, interaction if I don't have to. But you had, you had, you had a lot different uh, experience than I did because of, of the way you look. Sure, yeah, yeah, it matters. Because it, it definitely matters because yeah. I don't know why but some cops fear black people. Right. They think we're all gonna do them some harm. Yeah. They don't realize when we call them, we need their service. Yeah. We don't need them coming out at the wrong way. Yeah. We called you because we needed help. Yeah. And that's one thing, people, black people don't call the cops anymore. Yeah. They'll call each other. Right, yeah. Because they can, hopefully they can figure out the situation on their own. Well, and let me say this too. If the cops pull over a black person, and they do something that's wrong. Mm -hmm. I have no problem with the cop taking care of their business because yeah, yeah. I spent 13 years Jew. in juvenile hall. I yeah. worked for the Santa Barbara Probation Department. And sometimes people just do wrong. For sure. And if you do wrong, I don't care what color you are. Yeah. If you do wrong, then you have to be dealt with. Yeah. Well, yeah. plus another thing, if somebody is running away from you, yeah. that's no reason to kill them. Or they're running away. Because they're running away. Yeah. Now, if they're being confrontational, trying to take your weapon and beat you, yeah. that's one thing. But if I'm running away, because yeah. that was like when I worked in probation, they always told me, you don't have to get the last word. Yeah. You don't have to get the last word. You um, can de-escalate the situation and then move on. Yeah. I think for what you guys need to see is before, like, 
everything has been legal. Like segregation was legal. If you spoke out against it, you're a criminal. If you kind of speak out against change, that's who is typically painted as the criminal because even the cops, you know, when they kill someone, mm -hmm. legally, there's a lot of protection for them because they're in harm's way, right? The brutality should be criminalized and speaking out should, it, should be more encouraged, legally. I agree. Well, the first thing that I think that has to be done is you have to define the problem. Mm -hmm. And the problem is systemic racism. Yeah. And that means we are not at the same place as white people socially, mm -hmm. financially, yeah. and educationally yeah. because of the way the system is set up. And when we can get away from that, then we'll be at the place where we can have some serious change. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes that systemic racism is, is so subtle, right? It's not like people aren't like, oh, I didn't know that was, I didn't know that was a privilege of mine. Um, so I think there's a lot of blind spots. So I'm, I'm encouraged by what's going on because it's out there now of like, hey, check that privilege. Hey, this is this is a bigger problem than we thought, so. Yeah, and another thing, people my age, we're, we're brought up with, with different ideals and ideas about racism yeah. because of what happened during our lives. Yeah. Because right. a lot of bad things happened, and we've been through people, Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. I mean, what, what'd they do? They killed him. Yeah. I mean, so we, we have a, a reluctancy yeah to change because we think change is going to be deeply, deeply, deeply rooted. It's going to take decades. Yeah, just, yeah. You know, maybe your children's children yeah. will have it a lot better and things will be normal. Yeah. But the millennials and people that are younger now, they're getting on board with this. Yeah. And I yeah. have to think about myself and not go back to my old ideas. Yeah. And realize that this could definitely be a change. Yeah, yeah. And I'm hoping that it will be. We are too. Really hoping that this this means that something's gonna happen. And uh -huh. when I meet people like, well, I didn't get a chance to meet her in person, but like Navy, mm -hmm. um, I you know I have a lot of hope. So. Yeah. So anyway, we hope you enjoyed this show. We've uh, tried to bring some uh, some different perspectives. And again, it's. Uh, it's on us. We're taking the challenge seriously to do our homework and yeah. start to do more listening. Yeah. So we hope you enjoyed the content. Yeah. And again, don't forget to dig in. Learn something about Juneteenth. Um, there's you know, so much information yeah. out there. Texas um, made it a holiday a long time ago, and there's a push to eventually yeah. make it a national holiday. Yep. And, yeah. and the New York Times, I mean, they, they have a great show called The Daily. They did an awesome episode on mm -hmm. Juneteenth this morning. Um, and then they also have an amazing series. Uh, I think it's called 1616, which kind of describes the, the history of slavery from the beginning. So if you feel like your knowledge of black history is lacking a little, maybe check it out. Um, listen to it in the shower. I know we always have our phones on us at all times, so uh, there's always opportunities to learn. So, Well, I'm excited because, and I don't mean this in any light way, but um, in addition to July 4th for people like me, yeah. there's another day to celebrate freedom. <laughs> so um, two times yes, is better than one. So absolutely. anyway. So we hope um, you enjoyed it. This Monday, we'll be back with part two of our series on the murals yes. um, with Vicki Anderson and Ann Thompson. Um, and so we'll be talking with them on Monday. Mm -hmm. We also had a fun little interview with Gary James. Yes. Um, he described a uh, event that happened back in, I believe, 1983. Two or 83, 83 yeah. um, mm -hmm. when the Har Harlem Globetrotters came into town, um, but also his experience with them in junior high, which yeah. was really fun. Yeah. Um, so we'll be we'll be back on Monday for that. Yeah. So. so everyone have a great weekend. Remember, if you enjoy the show or it's your first time, all of our shows are archived on Facebook yes. and you can find them on YouTube for anyone that's not on Facebook. So again, tell your friends, tell your neighbors. Uh, we do this every Monday and Friday at 830 Live. Yep. So thank you for joining us. And have a great weekend. Have a we'll great weekend. Week. And here is your moment of zen from here in Lompoc. Thank you, Jacob Cole. <laughs>